welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome you to our next session. Uh, and we have uh, some very important contributors this morning uh, who are going to be dealing with uh, various dimensions of signaling that confer upon the OA site uh, much of its uh, developmental potential. Uh, and uh, it's a distinct pleasure for me to introduce our first speaker this morning, uh, Dr. Antonio Pellice, who's familiar to uh, many of you, who comes to us from uh, Evie in Valencia. Uh, and certainly, uh, uh, Tony, as we know him, has uh, been a major mover in our field since its inception. Uh, and we have today the opportunity to hear his viewpoint and advances on the subject of ovarian rejuvenation. Professor Pellice. Thank you very much, David. I apologize for asking to make a change in the, in the program, but I have to catch a, a flight, and, and Charles de Gaulle is a little bit away from the, from the city center. Um, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Shoham for inviting me to this uh, meeting, which is always interesting because we mix some science and, and clinical outcomes. Uh, we are very much interested in, interested in these patients uh, who are just, um, how is the pointer here? Ah, okay. Who are just um, um, highlighted here, women between uh, 38 and 43, 44 years of age, because they, as you know, uh, this is uh, probably, at least in our experience, 70% of our population. So all the time we have to deal with uh, older women, and uh, uh, some of them still have high uh, AMH and, uh, and a, a, a preserved ovarian reserve, and we can do ovarian stimulation with or without PGS. Uh, this is not the, the topic uh, um, today of my talk, but... Uh, in most in instances, uh, they have a low ovarian reserve, and, and we need eggs. We, we want to retrieve eggs, and we really don't know why. But it's not only about uh, the amount of eggs, but also about the quality of the eggs. And what happens when the, uh, when the woman uh, gets older is that some important components of uh, the chromosomes and, and the whole process of co uh, chromosome segregation go, uh, go wrong. Uh, this is the case for the kinetochores. This is the case for the amount of cohesin. If you compare uh, young uh, uh, segregation of chromosomes as compared to, to an older woman, and as a result of all these changes with age, what happens is that we have unemployed oocytes, we have unemployed embryos, and therefore most of our patients undergo egg donation. But although egg donation is very successful, uh, and we practice it a lot, this is something that initially, theoretically, every couple tries to avoid. And there are many, many attempts, different groups, are attempting to uh, approach this problem in order to increase the quantity and the quality of the eggs. In this regard, uh, you know, and, and probably there are some talks here in the, uh, in the, in, uh, the program uh, about the formation of a, a new formation of gametes from stem cells. As you know, uh, uh, gametes have been obtained from um, embryonic and iPSC uh, cells uh, in vitro, uh, using in vitro and also in vivo models. This uh, drawing comes from the last uh, paper published uh, uh, just a few weeks ago in which uh, a, a lab uh, from Japan was able to reproduce the whole process of uh, uh, egg development uh, in vitro, and, uh, and then uh, they were able to get PAPs. Many of the metaphase II oocytes were aneuploid. Uh, implantation was imperfect, but they got PAPs. They were healthy. So the whole uh, process is moving, and I'm sure that in a few years we will have some results, perhaps also in humans. 
But uh, this is a way to uh, make the ovaries younger, because if we are able to get good eggs from uh, uh, embryonic or IPSC uh, cells, then we are uh, in good shape. Now, the other alternative was uh, addressed uh, yesterday uh, by Dr. Kasper. He illustrated you about the injection of mitochondria into the eggs. We have also experience. We have uh, finished 48 women. We have our own experience. Uh, perhaps I'm not so enthusiastic as he is, but uh, this is another way that needs to be explored uh, further. And then there are other alternatives that people are using, and perhaps there are other that are not listed in this slide, which are basically based in increasing, in increasing the quantity of eggs that a given woman can make. Uh, this uh, um, approach was initiated by Dr. Kawamura, who will uh, illustrate you about the uh, in vitro activation method and his outcomes. We are working very close to him. We have already some pregnancies, actually five pregnancies using this system. So we need to uh, further analyze, continue working, understand how the system works and in which type of patient works. But this is a way to increase the number of, of uh, eggs that the woman can produce, and there is another one uh, that comes from um, from Greece that was presented at HRE, but I don't have data on this one, so I cannot talk to you about this one. So I'm going to concentrate uh, my talk in uh, something that is not covered by Dr. Kasper, is not covered by Dr. Kawamura, uh, which is uh, something that we are developing now and uh, uh, in our labs and in our hospital and is the effect of transplantation of bone marrow uh, autologous cells into the ovaries and see if we can uh, make these uh, resting follicles that any woman, uh, oops, sorry, if we can make these uh, resting follicles that any woman has in the ovaries, if we can make them grow. This is the, bi the basic principle. And why do we want to do this? That for several reasons. First of all, because we have learned from isolated cases of women who uh, were treated with chemotherapy and, and therefore the ovaries were basically burned out. And then they received uh, uh, bone marrow transplantation in their uh, cancer therapy. We learned that uh, uh, some of them recovered uh, fertility and had babies, babies that doing polymorphisms, it, it was shown that uh, they came from the mother and not from the donors. So the second uh, reason why we were interested in testing the effect of bone marrow on uh, the ovaries was uh, because of the uh, experience in other fields of medicine, especially in cardiology, people have used uh, bone marrow-derived uh, stem cells to regenerate the tissues, based on the principle that bone, these bone marrow-derived cells, when placed in the niche, they may have some uh, stimulating effects on the tissues. And the third reason was uh, something that we have already published. We published uh, this year in, in human reproduction, and it has been the therapeutic effect of these bone marrow-derived uh, uh, stem cells after apheresis, placing them with catheterins uh, close to the uterus in repairing uh, uteri uh, of women with uh, uh, Asherman syndrome. So for all these reasons, we uh, wanted to check whether this uh, stem cell ovarian autotransplantation that we call just SCOT uh, is able to reproduce to some extent the effect that we are seeing, for example, with the technique that Dr. Uh, Kawamura is applying, uh, implementing in Tokyo. So uh, to do this, basically, what we have done is to um, mobilized the bone marrow uh, cells during five days with colony stimulating factor. 
then isolated them with apheresis, injected into the ovarian artery of one side, uh, and the other one uh, remained as a control of the effects of the surgery, and this was done by catheterin. So, as you can realize, it's, it's, it's a difficult procedure that needs a hospital. You cannot do it in, in a private clinic because you, you need to involve the hematology department and the radiology department. But this was uh, the, initial, the initial concept, and we wanted to apply it in our low responder patients, the ones that I showed you at the beginning of my presentation. These patients with a, a low numbers of eggs uh, retrieved, uh, and we got permission and uh, registered this study for women uh, under the age of uh, 40 uh, with low ovarian response with a, a certain number of antral follicle counts, low but certain numbers, a certain amount of, of uh, AMH, uh, elevated but not very much elevated FSH levels. So the kind of patient that we uh, see in our practice every day, almost every day. And uh, to, uh, to do this, we, we first isolated the cells and uh, the, the cells were frozen. And before we injected these cells into the, uh, our patients, we wanted to uh, answer a, se a series of questions using an animal model, because we've, we thought uh, the, and we felt that that was pertinent. We wanted to know whether these cells injected into the, into the arteries enter into the ovaries, because if they are not present in the ovaries, it doesn't make sense to start. We wanted to know whether we should use the whole uh, bone marrow um, um, precipitate of cells, or should we isolate by uh, flow cytometry only CD133 positive, which are, uh, be to, are believed the most, uh, the most immature forms of these uh, uh, hematopoietic cells. Uh, and then we wanted to check also in the animal model whether we, we get follicular growth, which is our main objective. And, uh, and then try to understand how Scott works. So we did the, um, we, we stimulated the bone marrow with, um, with uh, CSF, and then we uh, got uh, these uh, cellular um, precipitates of mononuclear cells, and uh, uh, we divided uh, by um, using flow cytometry uh, these cells into two populations. One of them was composed of the uh, total amount of cells obtained from the bone marrow, the other one only the C, uh, CD133 positive cells. Now, now to look, uh, to check the, the um, and to establish the animal model, we got some uh, uh, cortex, uh, some tissue from uh, low responder patients undergoing a cesarean section after egg donation. So women who have a very a similar, a similar situation to the one that we are testing, but who underwent egg donation, and they got pregnant, they had a cesarean section, and we got permission from the hospital, obviously from them, to make a, a small biopsy and obtain some tissue. So once the tissue has been obtained, uh, we introduce this uh, human tissue into ovariectomized uh, null mice. So there is no immune uh, um, uh, rejection. And then after that, we injected in the animals either a PBS, uh, the precipitate containing only CD133, or the whole uh, precipitate that now we call Scott. And then we look at uh, the several uh, parameters, several markers, uh, and the first thing that we wanted to look is uh, uh, these cells, when injected into the animals, were stained with uh, rhodamine B, and we were able uh, to see whether they arrived to the ovary when injected in the tail of the animal. And you can see how they are localized uh, here, this is the control, and this is the CD133 and the SCOT. And you see how the cells are clearly localized in the ovaries, 
close to the vessels and close to the follicles, to the granulosa cells, but not to the oocytes. Now, the second uh, thing was to uh, evaluate in the animals uh, if there was follicular growth. And we saw how uh, at, the, at the beginning, uh, most of here, this in blue is the primordial follicles, and in gray and black is growing follicles, primary and secondary. And you see how the time goes by day one, one week later, and two weeks later, you can see here how the proportion of uh, growing follicles is much higher in those animals injected with cells than those animals injected with, uh, with uh, PBS. So we obtain follicular growth in these human uh, uh, tissues. Uh, then we also observe uh, the production of uh, estradiol. Again, with the whole precipitate was used more estradiol, more follicular growth that using only CD133. And uh, finally, we we'll look at uh, vascularization by looking at the, um, using immunostochemistry, in looking at uh, the uh, uh, antibody to look for CD31, which is a marker of hemat hematopoietic cells. And you can see here how, again, in the two groups, and uh, more pronounced in, in the BMT, uh, in, in the whole precipitate of cells, we had more vascularization. So we had good reasons to continue uh, our approach and uh, go direct to our patients, uh, from which, again, we got uh, authorization and the study was properly registered, is properly registered in clinical trials, et cetera, et cetera. And in these patients, uh, we, uh, once we did the catheterization in one artery, in an ovarian artery, having the other one as control, initially we wanted to see, to look at if we have, uh, if we have uh, an increase in the number of antral follicles seen by an ultrasound, and also an increase in serum AMH. And uh, uh, finally, we want to get the X, and we want to do IBF, Especially, we want to do uh, PGS to understand the quality of this X. Uh, looking at, uh, so to do that, we have uh, finalized and presented, not in paper, the paper is almost ready, but still going around it, but we have presented all this data that I'm showing to you today uh, at, in different meetings, HRE, um, SRI, uh, ASRM. So, in these patients, uh, as I mentioned to you, we did the catheterism either in the right or in the left artery. That was a, a decision of the, of the, of the radiologist. And uh, we looked at serum AMH initially every two days and then uh, every, uh, every week and then every month for six months to understand what's going on. And uh, the same was true for uh, follicular count, initially every week and then every month after six months, uh, up to six months. And on the top of that, we'll, we also checked the, uh, the blood of these patients in order to understand whether a, a potential response was associated with the release of uh, uh, several uh, growth factors which may influence uh, the uh, uh, results. Now, uh, uh, also we play a little bit with uh, uh, the plasma. We, we look at these factors, as I mentioned to you. All of them, uh, thrombosporin, fibroblast growth factor 2, or kidla, uh, the kid ligand uh, CFF, all of them related to follicular growth, angio uh, angiogenesis, etc. And also we, uh, we uh, mm, analyzed uh, more in detail the different populations of cells that we were injecting. Because as you saw in the animals, uh, the entire uh, uh, population of mononuclear cells was more effective than, uh, was more effective than only CD133. So we wanted to understand whether injecting in our patients uh, the cells and the different uh, composition of, of this uh, precipitates had a, a positive or, or no effect in, in, our, in the ovarian response. 
Now here you see uh, uh, the follow-up of the uh, serum AMH uh, levels in the 10 uh, first patients that we have done, we have completed, and we have analyzed. And uh, as you can see, it's a little bit of a mess. So it's, it's very difficult if we, you talk all, if you take all the data and try to, to draw conclusions, unfortunately, you don't see it. But if you analyze uh, patient by patient, then uh, you see some differences. You, you see patients in whom uh, a clear, in red is antral follicle count, in AMH uh, in blue. And you see patients in whom you have a clear uh, increase in both. Uh, you have also patients in whom you see an increase in antral follicle count, and however, you don't see a change in serum AMH, uh, like this one, like, like this one here. Uh, even like this one here, uh, this one. So they are totally different, and obviously you have patients in whom there is no response at all. So we decided to classify the outcomes according to two parameters, whether we found three or more, uh, more than three follicles uh, as compared to basal levels as a positive result uh, outcome for antral follicle uh, count. Remember that these patients displayed less than three eggs in all the stimulation. So we said, OK, if we double the number of follicles available, we are doing OK. And we expected to increase the, uh, by oh, sorry, two times the standard deviation, the serum AMH levels. And doing this, we were able to obtain positive results in six out of the uh, 10 patients uh, analyzed. In fact, we have two more who responded, but I, I didn't have all the data to put it uh, here uh, for you. So initially, let's say that six out of 10 respond, some others do not respond. It's interesting also to note that uh, when you see uh, the antral follicle count, you expect that uh, this antral follicle count is increased only in the injection site. But this is not the case. In 75% of the cases, so you find an increase in both ovaries. And this is because when you do the injection, uh, the real injection, just looking at the radiologist, how he's doing it. Of course, we don't do it. But we, we see how uh, the, the 40 milliliters of precipitate are injected. You see how some goes to the other side. So it's not a strange, unexpected to find a response on the contralateral ovary. Now, we have found also that there is a relationship between the response and the secretion of some growth factor, for example, uh, FGF2 uh, correlates very well with the number of, uh, correlates very well with the number of follicles and also with increased in serum AMH. Uh, and also, uh, uh, Thrombospondin is also uh, positively correlated with the number of, with the antral uh, follicle count. Now, regarding the, the uh, characteristics of the cells that we are injecting, uh, what I can tell you today, because again, I'm presenting data and of a work that is obviously ongoing, uh, I can tell you that the, uh, the whole precipitate, and especially the amount of CD133, does not correlate with outcome. In other words, not only injecting CF, you can do the work, because it doesn't correlate with uh, CD133. Uh, Just in, uh, squeezing the, the bone marrow releases uh, cells into the blood, but the body is too big. You need. Uh, we firmly believe that you need to put the cells close to uh, the niche where you want this effect to be, uh, to be done. However, if you look at the, the uh, proportion, the number of cells which are CD133 positive, CD34 positive, then you find a correlation with an increase in, um, in um, uh, serum AMH levels. Now, uh, the Final, the final answer will be uh, to analyze the data of the uh, in vitro fertilization, to be able to, uh, to release, uh, to obtain the eggs, do ICSI, and do PGS. This is, this, uh, most of these cycles have been already done, but the data 
uh, the data are not uh, pulled uh, and, and cleaned uh, sufficiently to show, to show them to you today. However, I take this opportunity to invite you to our meeting in Bilbao in, um, in May next year, here, 11, 13 May. I have a talk about this subject. I, I hope I can complete the story of the IBF cycles and tell you what's going on and uh, where uh, we go. For the time being, as I showed you, Using the animal model, we are able to release the cells in the ovaries. We are able to uh, increase follicular growth. Uh, looking at uh, uh, the first patients that we have carefully analyzed, you have a response in some of them. You don't have a response in others. We are trying to understand why yes, why not. Uh, it looks like the secretion of certain growth factors and the, and the composition of the, uh, of the uh, cells injected may, uh, may have a, an effect, but uh, in definitely uh, we need to, uh, to do more. Uh, we need to understand uh, why. We need to understand whether maybe using uh, these growth factors or others uh, is doing the same effect that we are doing with such an invasive, invasive technique uh, using uh, uh, bone marrow um, stimulation and uh, apheresis and radiology. Maybe we can uh, do it uh, simpler, much more simple. And at the end, the, the one million uh, dollar question would be if all this effort pays, because the, the, the answer is to find euploid eggs in these patients. And this is something that we still uh, don't know. We have a clue, of course, but we don't know for certain. And I just finished thanking the people who have done uh, this work, and thank you very much for your attention.